G'day, I'm Ash. I hope you're all doing fantastically well. Welcome yourselves to the BF109Z. Now, I've wanted this aircraft for a very long time. I only got a test drive of it on my review, which you can watch here up in the cards up above. But it's one of those vehicles that I just adore, and I've wanted it for so long, and now I finally got my hands on it. It's better riding 4.7. Its max speed is not great. Its acceleration is not great, but it does have four 30mm cannons. And they are German ones, so I quite like those. Again, looking over the different shell types, you can carry a bomb on it. But uh, I don't know why you would, because this thing is already slow as all. But I suppose it's an interesting aircraft nonetheless, and today we're going to see how it fares up in 2020. Now, not exactly the greatest pilot either, but in today's gameplay we're just basically going to be shooting down bombers, because let's be real, this is what this thing was designed to do, and if I can achieve that, at least I'll have achieved my main goals. That was an instant cue, I didn't expect that one. But hey, it's what it is worth, and I suppose you can watch that in my original video where I detailed what's going on with the vehicle as well as a brief overview and its history. So I'm not really going to cover that in this video, but suffice to say that this thing is not competitive nowadays. Still a good aircraft, yes, still very good airframe, but with the added weight of the 30mm cannons, it really tends to make this thing really sluggish. I kind of wished that the 30mm were only in the nose, and that was about it. So the two inbuilt nose cannons that run directly central of the engine because well the germans were quite clever with their engineering at least and allowed for bigger cannons in their nose mounted positions but the ones underneath the wings i feel like they add too much extra weight and the airframe itself is already compromising as is you're, you're carrying two sets of landing gears and there is well one vertical stabilizer but it doesn't retain the same amount of energy in a dive in fact it rips pretty damn quickly too and yes, I am switching between cockpit and other views quite quickly. I'm starting to get a little bit bored here. We, previous to this, we were playing A4Es, the new one, the Squadron vehicle. So I do apologize for flicking the camera around too much. I don't normally do this, although I do alt-tab quite frequently. And someone's pinging me on Discord. I'm quite irritated as is. As you can see, I'm flicking between the different modes just to sort of see what happens. Because usually, by now, in this kind of time period, the two-minute mark, you would have already engaged enemy fighters in jets, at least. Or you would have ripped your wings if you were an A4E, but that's a separate subject altogether. Cutting forward just a little bit, we have climbed up to about 3,800. This thing tends to optimally work around about this altitude. Any higher than this, and it tends to really struggle. So pulling after the wartime emergency, we're instantly greeted with a Spitfire. And do we turn directly towards him and lose all our speed? We are at 5,700 meters, so it should be quite easy, right? And with two other 109Gs with us, this should be no problem. Obviously, I'm not a squad with a moose, and I can't remember who else I was with, but these aircraft are quite good. And then all of a sudden, I spot a B-17. Now, remember my primary objective for this particular mission. It wasn't to shoot down enemy fighters. It was to ruin the enemy bombers and make the rest of my guys in my squad shoot down the enemy fighters. Well, it's working. There's two B-25s and there's a B-17. There's also an F6F. Now, I'm not interested in the F6F because I'm in something that is not necessarily the best fighter in the world. Although I did try using this as a fighter a few matches ago. And I... well, it's not very successful. <laughs> not anymore. And the incoming fire on that B-17 is very, very treacherous. But one quick burst. Actually, two quick bursts and we rip his wing off completely clean. Now, next target. B-25. F6F is now going after something else. We'll leave him alone, but... Now my left engine is completely and utterly uh, destroyed. So the, the one that my pilot's in, that's fantastic. So with a B-25 down low, we continue our pass and keep our speed up. Passing 650, actually we're nearly hitting 700 now. And again, you'll start to see this aircraft really start to struggle in terms of keeping its momentum going. I could just use all this energy go to go back up and climb, but no, nope, instead I'm going after a B-25. That poor... Poor B-25. What, what has he ever done to me? There we go. <laughs> Rip him a new one. There we go. <laughs> yeah, not exactly the best. But danger alert. Uh, danger close. There's a typhoon on our six. The rest of the team has dived in on this typhoon, though. Hopefully we can get a shot in on this typhoon. I don't know where he is going. Is he going to die to the, one of those 109s? Probably. Uh, so he's chasing a TAR-154, which is another fantastic interceptor. I'd say that the TAR-154 is actually a better aircraft than this one, only due to the fact that the TAR-154 can actually do damage to aircraft and actually maintain a decent speed and climb at that. This thing really struggles. Is that Typhoon going in? It is. The boys up top are still dealing with the Spitfire. I'm going to go in for this Typhoon. 
has he he's managed to kill two enemy aircraft looks like the 109g that was chasing that typhoon has also crashed oh i'm going to turn back this way i've just realized that my engine is now out and i don't necessarily have any other options other than to just land but there's another b25 so instead of going back to the airfield like i probably should have with a dying engine because this thing on one engine doesn't necessarily fly particularly well i'm going to chase this b25 and there it goes left engine is out it died overheating as you see in the, the left so it'll continue to produce a little bit of power it'll continue to windmill but from now on i'll be running on limited output which means i can't stress the other engine and unfortunately this thing is a brick without a second engine which again is a bit of a concern best advice for this thing is to side climb get as much altitude as you can watch for the rip speed conserve your ammunition as much as possible because you do have four 30 millimeter cannons and obviously try not to overheat your engine like i have uh, as you can see here i'm trying to shoot down this b25 i don't know if i'll be able to get him but i've only got 56 shells left as you can see the shells are sporadically exploding all around him as my gun targeting distance is not exactly the greatest now i will have to do some duck and weave tactics here but i really need to catch this bomber this will help the team out just a little bit and come on lucky shot there as i just run out of ammunition i seem to be having a lot of lucky shots pull back around we need to head back to base asap with both water empty and oil looking particularly terrible i don't necessarily think we'll make it but that's okay because the 109z is well it's an aircraft isn't it i couldn't help but pick the guitar up i'm sorry Let's go into, into the next match, I suppose. Now, we've climbed up to about 5,000 meters in the second match, and there are B-17. Now, I've already locked him on my target radar, and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I'd love to be able to actually engage with that B-17, but there are so many other fighters I decided to actually support the team this time. The a Seafire, a Corsair, another Seafire, and it's not often you see Seafires, but there are a couple of Corsairs coming in, and there are a couple of P-59s as well as a Yak-3U. Well, the Yak's just died. He's just got killed by an ME-264. However, the B-17, in a surprising move, has actually shot down the 288, which is incredibly funny, considering that there was a Seafire chasing him. I'm considering going after that Corsair. There's two of them. Moose is on one, and I decide to go for the other one. Now, had I had pulled the correct direction, I would have probably been able to kill him. However, I'm in my stupid infidelity. Decide to roll the counterwise uh, and rather than clockwise, and it was a bit anticlimactic to say the least. But silence is on him, and the Corsair realizes that I'm on him, and so I pull up directly for silence to be able to get a decent hit into that Corsair. Hopefully, things start to actually uh, level out. There we go. He's nailed the Corsair. Now we come up to the Sea Fire. There are other aircraft on fire, just checking my six briefly, and this sea fire needs to die. I don't like the sea fires, they are incredibly painful to play. It's because of the fact that they are incredibly heavy and rather, I guess, cumbersome. But that's due to the extra naval equipment. Now, pulling onto this guy's six, nope, we can't necessarily shoot him down either. And look, the whole entire team is now seagulling on that one thing. And as you can see, the rudder is not particularly effective, and neither does anything else. Now, this sea fire doesn't realize that I'm coming head on with him absolutely nail the living daylights out of him that's the only kill that we're going to get this match but hey we've done something and we have shot down an aircraft so now the focus is on the rest of the aircraft that are down here if we can nail the rest of their aircraft we basically win so many sea fires i i think there was a squad of four of them on the enemy team i wasn't entirely sure there but here, here is p51 there's a p47 and a couple of other aircraft up but aside from that i think we've killed most of everything and our team is doing really well, which is really quite surprising. Normally, this kind of matchup doesn't work terribly well, although that doesn't matter a great deal. But suffice to say that this aircraft isn't exactly the greatest. Decent airframe, as I said earlier in the video. The battle rating could go down. I reckon this thing could be at least 4 0 and still have some success. Although, turn fighting, the aerons lock up, the elevators ro lock up. As you can see, the limited travel on the rudders make sure that you don't really turn too effectively. So here's me in a hard turn. 
it's almost like flying a Heinkel 111 in a way, except it's just a slight bit m more maneuverable. There isn't any wing flex on this aircraft from what I see either. Mind you, they don't sell this vehicle either anymore, so that's not surprising. I'm probably one of, like, maybe 12 to 15 people that actually do own a 109Z. I don't know many people that bought it after the initial uh, announcement of when it came out a few years ago. As you can see, everyone's chasing that Corsair on the deck, and I'm preoccupied by that P-51 that's behind me. Now, I want some of this action too, but, you know, what can you get, I suppose? The Zvilling program didn't really last too long, although it was efficient use of, I guess, airframes. Although, to be fair, at that particular time, Germany just needed airframes up in the air to try and defend its factories. So producing more things and sacrificing more engines to a war cause that was already in a struggling deficit of materials wasn't necessarily the answer here anyway. So, engines and resources were limited, so now you've got an issue where, I guess, these aircraft aren't necessarily as feasible as an indigenous designed and streamlined aircraft that can do the job just as effectively. And I suppose that's why we saw the 109Z not being a particularly effective airframe as a whole. Although, one aircraft I'd like to see in War Thunder that is of Zvilling is the Heinkel 111Z. It's got five engines, and yeah, it is prone to braking directly in the center. In fact, it was used as a target, or not a target tug, but it was used as a glider uh, tug for most of, of its entirety lifetime. I'm sure you've seen the pictures and people asking about it in War Thunder before, but again, there are plenty of things that I'd like to see. It's just a matter of, are they useful or would they be practical in the War Thunder space? The answer is probably no, but it'd be a, a unique vehicle to add nonetheless. Well, there's plenty of unique vehicles in War Thunder. I don't think we need another event vehicle per se, or however, I reckon this thing could be transferred to an event vehicle. I don't think it's warranted uh, the fact that someone had, you know, bought this as a premium, considering the TAR 154 exists, and even higher up you can get the HE219, so this thing is really in a bad place, especially at its current BR, with things that really outperform it. As you see, this P-51 is just, just outmaneuvering us, no matter what we can do. We can dive down and try and pull up after him, but just look at the sluggish sort of feeling nature of this aircraft. It's really sort of in its own element, really. Pull directly up, I think, okay, right, I can get some shots of this guy. Got 152 cannon left. I guarantee you if I had 800 gun targeting distance, that guy would be absolutely dead out of the water. But, uh, he's not exactly dead out of the water. I go for one quick last burst. Unfortunately, 30 mils are incredibly low velocity. I'd have to aim incredibly high up in order to actually get there. So why I even attempted that in the first place, I don't know. And all of a sudden, a B-17 appears out of nowhere. Oh, well, we're going back to base for a rearm. Have any of you guys been experiencing performance issues with the new patch? I find it incredibly annoying that when I'm streaming, I have to run my graphic settings at a lower resolution and, and have lower textures as well. But when I'm basically playing by myself, I can up my graphics to a regular amount. As you can see, I'm getting about 140 FPS in the bottom left there with only 219 ping. I mean, ping is irrelevant of whatever. You can play War Thunder on 400 ping. It's not advisable, but, you know, us Australians, we don't complain about our internet service providers, although we do, but... It's not necessarily that important, I suppose, because in the hindsight, I'm still able to play this game. We'd have trouble playing other European and American uh, titles, but I don't know of many games that allow us to crossplay with so many different types of players. I can play with people from Russia. I can play with people from the US, EU, South America even. It is crazy uh, the amount of people that War Thunder draws in and has the stability for the servers, although recently, I would say over the last, since March of this year, the servers have been quite unstable, but, you know, what can you do? 2020 has been one bloody shit show of a year, and I suppose it just really reflects on the fact that, you know, the servers aren't doing so well, especially the American servers at the moment. But that is just the flavor of this particular aircraft. The 109Z just tends to be in that unfavorable position. I suppose that's why it didn't sell too well, which is why it was removed as a premium. I suppose that it's one of those aircraft that is unique to collectors now, but still, its battle rating probably needs to be lowered slightly, not, not too much, because if you do that, then this thing will absolutely wreck any of those lower end and, and low tier stuff. Considering its armament, it's very, very impressive, 
that's its really only selling point aside from being two 109 airframes stuck together and i think that'll have to do it for today's video thank you very much for watching guys i genuinely appreciate it i will see you in another video soon my name is ash catch you in the next one all right cheerio